Um, uh, as mentioned, I want to talk about um, uh, Apache Arrow um, and what that's about, um, and specifically in the context of as you're working with different kinds of data, how can it help you to get your job done? So as mentioned, uh, my, my role, I have two hats, and I'm actually wearing both of them for this talk. Um, so the first is, is that I started up a company called Dremio, um, which you may have seen the booth outside. We're here sponsoring the conference. Um, the second one is, is that um, I've been driving uh, with others the project Apache Arrow for quite some time, uh, since the beginning of that, actually. Um, so uh, those are my two roles. So let's start out with a story. Um, so I got here late last night. Um, and I was riding in the Uber from the airport, and the guy's like, oh, you gotta have, you gotta have some barbecue, you gotta have some barbecue. And so I'm like, okay, okay, I'll have some barbecue. So I got here, I'm like, Which, what, where should I go? He's like, you gotta go to Terry Black's. That's a good place to go. So anyway, I get to the hotel, I look online, sure enough, there's good reviews for Terry Black's, I know nothing about it. Um, it's a mile away. Um, and I'm like, what's the best way to get there? I look, they're closing in like 35 minutes. I'm like, okay, I'm gonna get an Uber, I don't know how else to get there. Like, I could walk it, but that's gonna be, not the best walking shoes for, for a mile or mile and a half or whatever it was. Um, so that's my thinking. I live in uh, the South Bay, uh, San Francisco area, so I drive more than I live downtown San Francisco, so I never scootered. So I ordered the Uber inside the lobby, and immediately I walk outside and I see scooters. And I'm like, God, I should have used a scooter. That would have gotten me there in time. Um, and I'm like, well, I'll use a scooter on the way back. So anyway, Go, go, to, go to Terry's, and as I'm walking into Terry's, I see scooters, and I'm like, well, I don't know what brands of scooters are here. I know about Bird, I know about Lime, but I don't know if those are the ones that are here. And so I walk, as I'm walking in, I see a bunch of scooters that look like this. Now, if you know what this is, you know it's a jump scooter. But if you don't know what it is, it's really hard to read what, this, what it actually says it is, okay? And so there was a bunch of them that were kind of worn out, and I'm like, I can't, I can't tell what that is actually saying on the side of it. Um, and so I'm like, well, I'll go, I'll go on, online and see what's going on with, with scooters in Austin. So I think you're the only place in the world that has this much content on scooters. Um, <laughs> I, I, I was shocked. There's this whole thing called dockless mobility. It's like its big initiative. And so first of all, I was able to find a list of all the scooter, uh, scooter companies around, um, which was cool. Uh, so I went through and I actually started clicking on them to figure out what the hell scooter this was. Um, sure enough, figured out it was jump scooters. Um, but the second thing I saw was, hey, look at this. You guys expose, or you, or at least the ones of you that are here from Austin, um, expose data about what's going on with the scooters. So I'm curious whether or not we can start to see patterns about what's going on with people at AnacondaCon using scooters through this data, okay? So I'm like, hey, this is an interesting thing to take a look at. So anyway, this, I, saw this last, I saw the information last night. This morning I'm like, hey, let me see if I can pull some, t something together about that. Um, and the question was, are there others here that are like me at AnacondaCon? Um, because honestly, I'd never ridden a scooter before. I did ride a scooter last night coming back to the hotel. It was fun. Um, it was interesting. I don't know that I'll do it again anytime soon, but it was good. Um, anyway, but the question was, are there others like me? And so how do you solve this problem? How do you start to understand what's going on with this data set? So this is a new data set, never looked at it before. I want to sort of figure out what's going on, start to do some analysis against it. Okay, so this brings me to the product that we built, which is called Dremio, which is a tool to help you try to find, access, understand data, and connect it to whatever tool it is that at the end of the day you want to actually ana analyze with. So it's not an analysis tool itself, it's trying to connect you um, with data. Okay, now um, I actually built up, before any of these thoughts around scooters, I actually built up a little instance myself um, for the demos that I was going to do later in this talk. Um, so what I did is I just dropped on my S3 bucket, I dropped the CSV for the Austin dockless mobility, okay? Now what's cool about this data is it's actually updated every night. So I downloaded it this morning, popped it up on, the S, on, on S3, you go to Dremio and you can simply set what the format is, and this one it's basically a, it's a Unix limited, or a Linux limited uh, CSV file which has headers, which is nice. Um, so anyway, so I dropped it into here, and that allows me in Dremio to look at it. Okay, so I can just see the data and start looking at it. Okay, I'm like, well, what do I want to do with this data? And I start to notice, well, it's a CSV file, so it doesn't have data types. So I went through the tool, and the tool allows you to do things like set data types for all the different things, clean up data, remove data that's not interesting to you. And so, for example, a bunch of scooters, uh, scooter, uh, scooter entries had uh, no uh, start or end locations. So I don't, I don't know what that's about, but that was part of the data, as, as you always expect. There's lots of dirty data. 
And so what I did is I actually built up what we call a virtual data set in Dremio, um, which is a bunch of different option operations, nothing that interesting. Basically just cleaning up the data, setting timestamps, eliminating data that seems to be empty, um, things like that. And so that gave me a base data, data set to look at. Um, and in Dremio, you create these things called spaces, which allow you to store a certain content, set of content that's in, interesting to you. And so this virtual data set is something called scooters in the Austin space that I created for this, for this talk. Now, I could just interact with that data um, and start playing with that data. But I was like, you know what's interesting? I want to actually look at it in the context of uh, what's going on here at AnacondaCon. And so what I did is I actually built a data set on top of that scooter data set called the Fairmont Austin um, data. And so this Fairmont Austin data, I actually said, okay, I'm gonna take that data, I'm gonna wrap a, a, a bounding box around it. I went and found out what the, a good bounding box was for Fairmont, the, this hotel, because I didn't know what that was. And then I basically categorized the data in a couple of different ways. So I started out by categorizing the data for whether or not the uh, ride either started at Fairmont or ended at Fairmont. Okay, so t the same bounding box, but was it the start location or the end location? I also categorized it down to, to actually start to categorize the trip distance, because I started to see some patterns in the data as I started to analyze this, and so I started adding more sort of information in here, and basically categorized trip distance. So anybody who's under one meter, um, I consider it to be a noob, um, because that probably means you started the scooter and stopped the scooter without actually moving the scooter. Um, so you just paid the dollar to that company. Now that's, I think they're, they're happy you do that, but to me that's a suggestion that you didn't necessarily have that much comfort with the scooter. Um, then I actually said, hey, anybody who's going under 500 meters is probably someone who doesn't like to walk. Um, and so I, I, I categorized them as lazy, and then everybody else was normal, okay? Um, and then I said, let's look at the data. And so in this case, I built this data set up, um, and then what I did, if I close this out here, is I dropped into Tableau. So I know that not everybody here uses Tableau. A lot of people use different kinds of tools to look at data. Um, I happen to use Tableau quite a bit to look at data and opened up the data set here. You can click in Dremio and it pops up and, and, and lets you log in and then access that data set directly. Now, to not take you through the process of building up analyses, I actually built up some analyses that I was looking at earlier today to see what was going on with the data. And so here is the time analysis of scooter rides that started at, so I actually applied a filter here. Oh no, actually I guess I didn't. I have both routes here. So this is the number of records that ended at the Fairmont. This is the number of records that started at Fairmont. And then the time since the beginning of the year and the activity. Okay, and my first question was gonna be, hey, can we see the spike because the Anaconda event is here, that there's more scooter users? And the reality is no, we can't, right? We're, like, we're right here at the end, right? So in fact, we actually use the scooters less than it seems like everybody else does. Interesting. Um, the second thing is you're like, oh wow, yeah, I wonder what's going on here. Well, South by Southwest must be going on there, right? So clearly substantial amount of use in South by Southwest, right? And so I was like, okay, well let's look at just in the last 48 hours, um, the use of scooters, right? And I was trying to say, hey, I wonder how much pattern you can see around the agenda of AnacondaCon and whether or not people are going and using scooters at different times. Um, didn't come up to anything super interesting here. Well, one, it looks like people are going to lunch, okay? So people apparently didn't like the lunch here or wanted to go off to lunch. Um, uh, and then the other one is, is that at nine o'clock a bunch of people left. And so nine o'clock was after the, the, the party last night. I'm not sure what was happening that everybody decided to go someplace else. Um, and so, anyway, I'm looking at that. The other thing that I saw here, and I saw this across the board, right, even the general time analysis, apparently, people like to take scooters from the Fairmont, but when they're coming back, they don't use scooters. The amount of people who take scooters away is way more than the people who come back, right? So anyway, so I also looked at, hey, what's going on with, this, with, with the map here? So hopefully this map will reload. The map doesn't reload. Basically, if you can see my cursor here, oh yeah, there we go, there's, there's the map. So, the Fairmont Hotel is basically right here, okay? Um, and so if you can see my cursor, it's, it's kind of in this zone, okay? And I was looking at this map, and this is when I started to actually say, hey, maybe we should look at what's going on here, because if you look at where people went with scooters from AnacondaCon, most of them went nowhere, right? Like if you look at it, they went here, they went here. These are, these are the end destinations of people who started at Fairmont, right? So basically they didn't go anywhere, okay? And that was when I started saying, hey, what is going on here? And so I broke it down and I said, hey, what is the minimum trip distance, what is the max trip distance by hour as well as the average? And what you see here is these crazy short av uh, minimum trip distances, right? So minimum trip distance here is 112 meters, but then all of a sudden at noon, there's all those people and then they're actually just going zero distance. Now that could have been one guy who, or gal who was just trying to figure out how to use a scooter and started it stopped it 12 times. 
Um, but you basically see a bunch of situations where people were very low in their scooters. And so this is when I said, hey, what I want to do is actually take a look at the use of scooters and see whether or not the people who use these scooters at AnacondaCon are different than others, right? And so I came up with those categories. One, your noob, who's someone who doesn't actually go anywhere. And the second one is someone who's lazy, who doesn't go more than 500 meters, okay? Probably something that could have been walked, okay? Um, and I apologize to those people who actually have injured feet or whatever, I'm not talking about you. Um, so I was like, okay, let's look at those two things. And this is when I dropped into a notebook and I said, okay, let me build up stuff. Now, I'm a SQL person. I could have done this with, with different kinds of tools. I'm a SQL person, so I actually built it up using SQL. And I basically wanted to categorize how many people were noobs out of the total amount of people. And I was like, well, what am I going to compare it to for a baseline? And I said, well, South by Southwest might be an interesting baseline, right? Like, at one hand, I'm like, well, it's got to be a lot of people who are, um, you know, using scooters a lot, it seems like, coming to South by Southwest. Um, and so I, anyway, I was like, oh, let's compare these things. And so this is what I came up with, was the South by Southwest late audience is about 22% of people are lazy, okay, out of the total scooter rides. Um, and actually, Anaconda Con is a little bit less. So, hey, good for us, right? Um, on the flip side, uh, it turns out that there's more noobs for us. So. Apparently, people use scooters more than in the audience that go to South by Southwest. Now, the one thing I wanted to compare it to was, how does this actually compare to things when no event is going on? And what's interesting there is, is that apparently, there's more lazy people in AnacondaCon and South by Southwest as opposed to the norm. Um, but on the flip side, we're generally slightly better at using scooters, okay? So jumping around here, the access, whether it's in one tool or another tool, the goal is to be able to get the data very quickly. Um, so let's go to a couple of slides to talk about that. But the good news here, and I apologize ahead of time to the vegetarians, was I did, in fact, have success and enjoy some brisket and a beef rib. So let's talk about what that Dremio tool is, and then we'll talk about Aero, and then we'll talk about how those things fit together. So Dremio is an open source product. Um, we have a community edition and an enterprise edition, where, you're where it's basically designed to help you sort of find, access, curate, share, and secure your data, right? So Think about all the things that you need to do with data before you can actually start to consume it. You're gonna have to clean it up. You may have to like, you know, canonicalize some things. You may need to join it with some data that's sort of very specific to your business. All of those things are things that actually should be shared. That's kind of one of the main thinking that we have with Dremio is, is that each, today, many times, several different people inside of an organization are doing the same steps with this data. Okay? And that's because you start building up your analysis inside your, inside your notebook and then someone else has to go through the same set of steps in their notebook. And so with Dremio, the goal is, is that one person can go through these steps, other people can then go and find the data, and they can collaborate together around it, okay? It's designed to run on your laptop, or it can run in a cluster. So we have customers that are running, you know, five, six, seven hundred nodes of this in a cluster environment, and then we also have people who just use it on their laptop. Um, and it's really, really fast. The goal is to be able to get data to, access to data faster than what you can do today. Okay, and the way that we do that is in large part built on top of something called Apache Arrow, which I'll talk about. We also use Parquet a lot and several other things. And one of the key things that we do is we try to abstract away the details of what source of data you're accessing. So whether you're accessing a CSV file or you're accessing an Elasticsearch cluster or you're accessing MongoDB or Oracle or SQL Server, all of those things have their own interface. Some of those are, are actually SQL, but even their SQL dialects are different. And so Dremio says, you know what? Someone who's consuming data shouldn't have to worry about all of those details and should be able to just access a data endpoint and always use a single language, in our case SQL, to access that data, okay? And then lastly, if you haven't already, you should get a, uh, if you like our narwhal, his name is Gnarly, and he's our mascot. And so you'll see him around. Um, you saw, probably saw him outside there in the booth. Um, go through a couple of slides here in detail, but basically we look at the problem of data access as, as basically a problem that two main groups of users have, okay? The first are data consumers, so people who are actually trying to get the data, right? They wanna figure out how they can get this data into a shape that's useful for whatever tool they have. And the second one is data engineers. These are people who are actually responsible for getting data, uh, the mechanical heavy lifting of data, reorganizing data so that it makes sense for the business, that kind of thing. And Dremio is really built to sort of help these two users do their jobs on a daily basis. Okay, and the way that it works is it sits between whatever data sources of data you have and whatever tools you want to ha use to actually analyze your data. Okay, and there's a bunch of components about how it does this, but at its core, it's about how do I make this data available to people? 
okay? Now, one of the key things here, and I'm not gonna talk a lot about it in this talk, but one of the key things that we do is something we call data reflections, which is the ability to materialize different versions of data, and then when a user asks for data, or is consuming data for a particular purpose, we can pick the fastest version of that data to get them the data as quickly as possible, okay? And so in this example here, I created a reflection on the CSV file because parsing the CSV file over and over again and casting all of those things actually takes some time, and I want as interactive a response time as, fa as possible. Another way to think about it is Google Docs for your data. This idea that you can create it, uh, an, uh, an artifact and share that artifact with others. You can set permissions around that artifact um, and basically avoid doing duplicative work that people typically do. As I said, we are fast. The reason we are fast in large part is because of Apache Arrow. So the product has been out for a little less than two years. Arrow's been out for more than three. So when we started the company, we started thinking about how do we make this a fast product when it's sitting between those other things. And one of the key things we came up with was the idea of Apache Arrow. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Um, yeah, so let's talk about Apache Arrow. So most of you, I think probably most of you have heard of Apache Arrow by now. It's great news that you have because a few years ago that wasn't the case. So let me talk a little bit about that. So, Arrow at its core is a standard for in-memory data and how you represent that data for high-performance processing, okay? It's designed to speed up a bunch of different workloads. It's focused on analytics, um, and it's really about a consensus-driven approach to this representation of data. And so uh, the project is got, has, I don't know, 30, 40 different people who are involved in it um, who drive, the, that are stewarding the project um, that are from many, many, many different companies. Um, and that's a key part of what's, why it's important and why I think it's been as successful as it has. Arrow had this idea, right? And so when we were looking at the problem of interoperability, okay, we thought about, well, shoot, there's a huge amount of formats that are already designed for interoperability. Like, I can just send stuff in REST and JSON, I can send it in Thrift, I can send it in Protobuf, I can write it to a file of various different formats and communicate it that way. The problem with all these things are is that they're fairly expensive, okay? And the reason that they're fairly expensive is not about the format itself. The format may be an efficient format to move data. The problem is, is that systems don't use those formats internally when they're working with data. Okay, so what happens is, is that every time you move from one system to another system, you take an internal representation of data, you go through several steps of serialization and, and encoding, you put it on, say, the wire, then you get it to the new system, and that system has to deserialize the data and put it into an internal representation again, okay? And not only is it that transfer between those different representations, but in most cases, those APIs are typically built on top of uh, methods, right? So I wanna access the value in this cell. Okay, and so even the, 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 the requirement of e reading cell by cell out of data between uh, one system and another system becomes very expensive. And so when we were looking at interoperability, what became clear was is that it was more important to think about how do people adopt a format internally than it is about, you know, about the actual format that's being used to do interoperability. Okay, and so we basically said, forget everything you think about when you think about interoperability of data formats and focus on processing. Because if we can build a representation of data that's very efficient and common for processing purposes, then as systems adopt that representation to improve their processing performance, all of a sudden when one system is talking to another system, they happen to have the same internal format, and therefore the interoperability can be very, very highly efficient. Okay? And so that's kind of the, 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 the idea behind Arrow. And how it started was, is about four years ago, uh, I, got, I got to know Wes McKinney. Okay, and so I came from the database side, he came from the data science side, and what we identified together was is that those two communities hadn't done a good job of ever integrating with each other. They're kind of of two different worlds, okay? And so when we came together, we basically spent the next six months talking to different people, starting to socialize this concept of Arrow, um, and then after about six, eight months, something like that, we then launched the Apache project. Um, so since that time, we've seen a huge amount of adoption. Apparently, we've lost that slide. Well, that's okay. I believe that last month there was about two and a half million downloads of Arrow in that one month. Um, so that's amazing given that the first artifact of Arrow was available, I think, two or a little bit less years ago. Um, and so a uh, huge amount of success there. What is the representation? I'll go through these slides pretty quickly, but just give you a quick overview of them. Um, but the representation is, uh, supports it's a shredded, nested data structure representation. So it doesn't just support flat sort of rows and columns. It supports arbitrarily nested data structures. It's designed specifically to be randomly accessible so that you can do high performance processing without having to encode into a different representation. Um, it's very much focused on maximizing your CPU efficiency, pipelining things through the CPU, 
ordering th organizing things in a commoner way to improve both cache locality, et cetera, and also designed to very easily um, and efficiently scatter and gather um, onto your network socket or your disk. Okay? Oh, I do have the slide. Well, there it is. So a huge number of projects have adopted the, the technology, um, and that really goes to the fact that it is a foundational technology. Um, and, the, and as you see the, the chart of downloads, it's a pretty amazing chart. Um, so I had the chart from a couple months ago. It was, I was like, hey, it's a million downloads a month. That's awesome. Now it's two and a half million. So it continues to do uh, very, very well. So let's talk about the format in a little more detail. So you basically have all the standard types that you would think about in most sort of data representations. You've got scalars, things like Booleans, integers. You've got date, time, timestamp, intervals, uh, strings, and binary data. You've got the sort of main three complex types from my perspective, which are struct, map, and um, lists. Um, and then you also have a union type, which is for exposing things that are heterogeneous. So for example, if I'm processing a JSON file and the first, fi the first record, field A, is an integer and the second record, field A, is a, string, a list of strings, I should be able to support that, um, even though there's no name to that, to that union. And so uh, Arrow also supports that concept. When Arrow, if you think about Arrow, it's this representation of data and how you lay it out in memory. Um, and then how you communicate that between different systems, okay? And the way you communicate is, is that you start by sharing schema information between the two different systems. Then you potentially, if it's, the arrow is can be dictionary encoded, you will share a dictionary or a batch which just defines how to dictionary encode the different values. Um, and then a bunch of batches of data which are called record batches, which are actually chunks of records in a commoner representation, but they're all the, rec all the columns for that chunk of records. Uh, record batches, typically we target, when we're using stuff, different people use different things, but we typically target around 256K of memory per record batch to keep things close to the cache. Here's some details about how it lays out memory. The main idea to understand here is, is that it's commoner in its representation. So data is set out next to each other, so all the name data is next to each other, all the age data is next to each other, and all the phone data is next to each other. And we also encode the different kinds of data next to each other. So if you're talking about strings, which are names here, the name here, then we actually encode all the data end to end, and then in a separate vector, we encode the start and end point of each string, okay? And so this allows you to do operations just on data, just on the metadata of the data structure, um, but it's also lined up very well to do all sorts of efficient things on the CPU. And so if you actually look at the integer representation, this is designed very well to fit within your SIMD instructions that already exist, um, and fo when we focus on alignment and whatnot to make sure that that happens. You then take all these different structures and you put them together, and that is one record batch. So these might be, let's say that's 64,000 records in this batch. So you're gonna have all the data for the, so there's actually three vectors for a string. There's the offset and the data, but then there's this third one, the validity. So validity says you whether or not this is a valid point of data. And so these things are basically end to end. Then you put the age information, then you put the other, uh, the phone's information, et cetera. You put all these things together, that's a record batch. Okay, and there's two ways to think about a record batch. One is, is that in some situations, Arrow may be actually sharing data in the same process or in a shared memory context. And in those cases, that data could be scattered all over your memory, okay? But if you're putting it on the wire, and that's what I'm gonna talk about in a little bit, in those situations, you generally compact this stuff all together. You, put a, you do a gathering write um, where you send the stuff on the socket um, so that the other side receives the data in this sort of end-to-end um, -end format. But that's not actually a requirement of the format itself, okay? So when you think about Arrow, the first thing that we did was we built a whole bunch of core libraries. These core libraries are in, I think, 14 different languages now. This is only a subset of all of them. Um, and so if you're working in any of these languages and you're building a data application, you can use these libraries to build up that representation um, with the, in that native language, okay? And not every one of these are a native implementation. Some of them use a C binding, but most of them are actually native implementations so that you can debug it and understand it yourself. So on top of those libraries, we then have what I call building blocks, which are additional components in the Arrow uh, uh, packaging, uh, collection of, of tools um, that are for solving specific problems. And four of them that I think are important to know about, uh, first is the uh, Arrow Gandiva project, which is a sub-project of Arrow that is focused on building an LLVM-based compiler for arbitrary expressions. So in many situations, you're gonna do a calculation like A plus B minus two divided by 0.2 or whatever that might be, right? Those expression trees uh, typically can be a, a fairly expensive part of your processing pipeline depending on what you're doing. 
And so having a, uh, a runtime generated code base that allows you to process those things very efficiently um, can be very cool. And the reason that Gandiva can exist and actually write very, very efficient algorithms is because Gandiva knows exactly what the representation of the data is in memory. And so you can take Gandiva and you can build up an arrow structure in JavaScript and then hand it to Gandiva and it will process that data with that arbitrary expression much more efficiently than you could do any other way. All right? And that doesn't really matter what language you wrote it in. Gandiva is written in LLVM and C++, but it also has bindings for Java and Rust and several others now. Okay? The second one, and this is where I'm going to go into a lot more detail, is called AeroFlight. And that's really about communicating data between different processes that want to share Aero data. Okay? Two others that you should know about. One is Feather. And so Feather was a very early project that was added to the Aero uh, initiative. And the Feather project is really about serializing data for a, an ephemeral purpose. So if I want to go from one application to another and I don't have Aero Flight yet, one of the easy ways to solve things is just write stuff to disk and then go to the other application and read it out of disk. But you generally don't want to spend any time encoding that data because you know you're going to be throwing it away right after you read it. And so Feather is a very lightweight format that allows you to drop data from memory into disk and then bring it back out. And then lastly, Plasma is a shared memory storage layer um, focused on single node um, that allows you to take a, a representation of data, and then Arrow is an example, and store that in shared memory and then access it through, uh, via multi with multiple applications. So on top of the building blocks, there are actually several really important integrations that you probably know about, or if you don't, here they are. Um, the first is, is that um, because we're working closely with Wes, Pandas is doing a lot of adoption of Arrow to improve performance of a bunch of core uh, processing algorithms. Um, we're also working with the Spark community. And so now if you want to do Python operations inside of Spark, um, they're something like 70 times faster than they used to be because you could, uh, the, uh, the um, Spark libraries actually use Arrow as the representation to move between the Spark context and the Arrow context. Um, Dremio, the project that I work on, um, we'll uh, I talked about that a little bit. Um, the Parquet project is adopting it heavily to improve the performance of pulling data out of Parquet files and writing Parquet files. Um, and then, I, shoot, I forgot to update this. The NVIDIA guys are going to, Josh is going get to get on me on this. Um, the NVIDIA Rapids initiative, used to be called the GPU uh, uh, Open Analytics Initiative, um, is also adopted Arrow as the internal format, um, in the in-memory representation for GPU analytics. Um, so basically, you're seeing it in a lot of the common things that you use now, and the goal is to basically in, in, uh, speed those up. So I always hit this slide because Arrow is a lot of things, but there's a lot of things it isn't. And I want to make sure that you don't think, oh, well, it competes with this, or how is it going to replace that? It's a foundational layer, OK? So it's a specification. It's a set of libraries and tools for dealing with data, standards of how to move that data around between different systems, um, obviously very designed very, for very efficient processing. Um, but what it isn't, it's not an installable system. So there is no arrow like daemon that you run. It isn't a distributed system. Some people think that it's an in-memory grid. It's not that either. You could build all of these things with it. Um, but itself is not that any of these things. Um, it's also not designed for single record or streaming applications where you need you can't deal with at least batches of data. Okay, it's really focused on analytical where you're going to be having a decent amount of records in each one of those record batches before you push it along a wire or whatever. So that's Arrow. So let's talk a little about flight. I'm going to go fast here because I know I'm going to run out of data, run out of time. Um, Arrow flight is the next phase of Arrow. So Arrow came out two or three years ago, whatever it was. The project started three years ago. The downloads came out like two years ago, and we've grown it since then. Aeroflight is the next phase. And so about a year ago, we started the Aeroflight initiative. And the goal here is to have a standardized way of moving data between different systems, a high performance wire protocol that you can have in multiple different languages to move data between systems, between different applications that are not necessarily on the same system. So you can do shared memory before, but if I'm not on the same system, or if I'm in containers where shared memory is not really a thing, um, I can use Aeroflight to communicate that. It really is about this, if you think about it, it's, there's building blocks, right? That we started out with, hey, we need a representation that's common. Then we need libraries for that representation. Now we want to be able to communicate that representation on the wire between different systems. So it's the real prom it's really trying to fulfill the promise of interoperability of systems. Um, and, and that's sort of the core of what Aeroflight is. In Aeroflight, there are two main types of operations, data operations and actions, okay? Data operations, are generic, like I want to get a stream of data, I want to give you a stream of data. Those are the two main data operations, okay? On top of that, we then have actions. Now, actions are per application. 
Um, so it's a generic interface in the Aero library, in the Aeroflight libraries, um, to allow you to have sort of different concepts of what an action might be for a data microservice. And so I'll talk about this a little bit, this concept of a data microservice. So you guys are all familiar with microservices in general, but one of the things that happens today is, is that people generally don't have a way of binding different data services together if they're doing analytical workloads. What they do instead is they usually write data to disk, okay, because that's the easiest way to get a large amount of data from one application to another. The goal with Aeroflight is that you no longer need to do that. And so people can build a service which scores a bunch of data um, and package that up and then have an Aeroflight endpoint where you send in data and then you pull data out, okay? A system that maybe is uh, caching data uh, in memory, right? So that you can write data into that and then someone else can read it out. And so it's basically trying to abstract the way, the details of what that system is doing and say, hey, let's just have a common way of communicating large streams of data um, between different systems. But on top of that, you may want to have different operations. So if you think about the ca in, 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 in memory caching scenario, you might want to be able to expire something in the cache or say, hey, pull this data out of S3 and put, load it into the cache. Those would be specific applica actions for that application, and the Aeroflight protocol supports defining these actions for each type of application you might be building with Aeroflight. Uh, I'm going to skip over this because I know I'm not going to have enough time. Um, but basically, I'll post the, the slides. This is an overview of how the protocol works um, in detail. Uh, one of the, the important things to note about the protocol is, is that it's parallel by definition, okay? So if you realize when you're working with large data sets, odds are you don't want one stream to move data between two systems. So as I talked about before, we work with a lot of customers where we're running on hundreds of nodes at a time, and I want to take hundreds of nodes and communicate with hundreds, hundreds of nodes. And the last thing I want to do is have to do that through one stream. And so when you go and get a data, uh, of what's called an error flight, uh, from, from one node and say, hey, how do I access you? That will actually return and say, hey, I've got these 150 streams, okay? And here's all the places you can get each of those streams so that you can go to all those places at once with all of your nodes and pull that data in parallel, okay? And so more and more people are doing distributed co um, computing, and so being, having that as a core component of Aeroflight is, is very nice. Now, it doesn't require that the consumers or the producers are multi-stream. So if I'm a consumer and, and I just, I'm on my laptop, which is what I'm gonna demo in a second, in that case, I'm just gonna pull one stream after another. I'm, 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 I can choose to parallelize it on that one laptop, um, but I don't have to, okay? Uh, there's also a security uh, authent uh, authentication uh, set of uh, uh, pieces to the protocol. Um, so you can, so you can go read about those online. Um, and it's also designed to support back pressure and stream management. So if you don't know, we built our stuff on top of gRPC, um, which is a great library, although it's more focused for application communication, so we had to make several changes. But one of the nice things about gRPC is it's built on top of HTTP2, and HTTP2 has a concept of streams. And if you think about pulling data between two systems, one of the things you really have to worry about is whether or not the back pressure works correctly for what you might want to do. And so the common sort of use case where this could be a problem is, is that you've got two different people who are consuming from the same system, and they're consuming in a shared context, so they're consuming over the same socket. In that situation, you may have user A who's pulling data very slowly, and user B is pulling data quickly. If user A, in a, in a system where they don't manage this well, if user A doesn't pull the data, user B can never get his data, okay? So with HTTP2 streams and the way that we built this on top of, uh, with Aeroflight, that's not at all the problem. So if user A is not pulling quickly, then that back pressure gets pushed across the wire so that the sender will actually stop sending. But at the same time, user B can continue to pull. So you're basically multiplexing on a single socket um, to make sure that individuals are not impacted by each other. Um, so let's talk about inaction. I've got a little example I want to show here, which is uh, a Jupyter Notebook. So I've got Python 3.7. Um, and I'm going to compare three different things, PyODBC, Turbo, tur TurboDBC, I don't know the right way to say that, um, and Pyro Flight, okay? Um, and I've actually connected this up to, up to Dremio, and I'm running it on some EC2 instances. So let's go over here to uh, the first example here, and I'm gonna just reload this because I know that a notebook never likes to run um, unless you reload. Um, okay, so all I've got going on here is I'm gonna show you so basically two different things to start. I'm gonna be running with PyODBC, and I'm gonna be running with Aeroflight. And I want to show you what the difference is in performance once you start to use Aeroflight, okay? And so here, I've just got a couple of imports, and then I've actually written some utility functions to just pr print the time of doing two different operations, a PyODBC query and a flight query, okay? And so the first thing to note about this is, is that uh, if you run small queries, so here I'm just going to, I have a ran random data set. It's the line item table from the TPCH benchmark. It's maybe 10, 12 columns, 
15 columns, something like that. Um, the table is fairly large on this cluster so that I can do a large query on, to show you, um, but uh, for the first query, I'm just gonna go get 2,000 records, okay? Well, 2,000 records isn't a lot, so if I run this thing, you'll see they're about the same, right? So it's whatever, uh, it's 30 milliseconds versus 54 milliseconds. I think if I run this five times, they'll kind of swap around because it's kind of in the noise, okay? So small data sets, it doesn't matter. Like you can use your ODBC stuff that you have today. The question is when you do larger stuff. And so let's go here and we're gonna run the PyODBC run and let's wait a little bit, okay? So if you think about it, this goes to exactly what I was talking about before about interoperability, okay? When you're communicating between two systems, if you think about this example, so this is talking to Dremio. So Dremio has to get the data into a representation that can be communicated via ODBC on the sending side, so there's work that has to be done there. And then on the receiving side, PyODBC has to take the data at the cell level and read it out into an internal representation so that it actually can work with the data. That internal representation transformation can be very expensive, and so I'll actually show you TurboDBC in a second and see how that's faster. And so hopefully, unless I completely lost my demo, uh, we should get a result back here. Um, and so the goal is, is that, hey, I'm gonna have some data into, my, into a data frame or whatever I'm using. The problem with that is, is that if it takes a long time to get data back, it means that I start to go and lose my focus, right? I'm a, I'm a data analysis, uh, data scientist, I'm trying to uh, figure some stuff out and I wanna go get some data and start working with it and guess what, it took a long time to do so I start surfing the web, I go and get a cup of coffee and I lose my focus and I lose sort of the, the efficiency that I might have. And so here's an example. So this one, this is five million records. It's not a big data set. This is how long it took, 53 seconds to get it back from ODBC, okay? So what's the difference with Aeroflight? Well, let's run that one too, okay? 1.3 seconds, okay? So what you guys are doing today, we can make it faster with Aeroflight, and that should make it more efficient for you guys to work on stuff. And so to give you some sense of this, I actually ran it last night. I'm not gonna wake you, wait for it now, um, but I actually ran it last night and wanted to figure out how long it would take to pull a billion records into the data frame, which I actually can do with this and did last night. I'm not gonna make you wait now, but with Aeroflight, it was 199 seconds. So there, that's a little bit like, okay, I gotta go get coffee for that, I don't really wanna wait three and a half minutes, okay? But still, a completely reasonable amount of time to pull a billion records into my data frame for analysis purposes, okay? Now, to give you some sense of what that means when we would compare the two different things, if I use PyODBC to do that, it'd be two and a half hours, right? So if I can take two and a half hours to three minutes, that's gotta improve my productivity in a day, okay? Now, compare that, I, one of the things that people, when I showed, I showed this once before, um, and someone was like, well, Turbo DBC is actually way more efficient than PyODBC, so it's not really fair to compare that. And so I actually did the same set of operations on Turbo ODBC uh, earlier today, and so 22 seconds. And that's not for the billion, that's the five million, okay? And so if you put this in numbers, let's go back over here, this is what it looks like, okay? So PyODBC, this is five million records. PyODBC, uh, this, this is a previous number. I didn't update it right now. So it was 54 seconds when I ran it earlier, 22 seconds for Turbo ODBC, and 1.3 seconds for PyAero flight, right? So this should hopefully help you be much more productive in doing your work. Now, it'll take time for different technologies to adopt AeroFlight, um, but Dremio, we're pushing it hard, and I think that other people are, are starting to look at it uh, seriously across the board. So it should help you guys' uh, productivity on a day-to-day -day basis, and so when you layer that with other things like Dremio, it should be really helpful for you. So already flight status, so just to clarify to you, flight is actually not GA yet, it's just we've, we've got all the things working together and the next version of Aero will include a GA version of flight most likely, um, but we already have connectors, uh, or, uh, bindings for C++, Python, and Java. We're gonna work on other languages after that and that's sort of the first three languages you usually start with in the, in the Aero project. As you saw, between a 20 and 50x performance improvement, it's pretty nice. Um, so we've actually tested uh, performance extensively with Aeroflight, and that was part of when we were building it up, um, and we can get 20 gigabits per second performance um, on a single core, single stream scenario when we're using an average size batch of data. Um, so pretty awesome there. Uh, we'll focus on the, getting the GAs out, and then we're actually working with like, some community members who are working on a Kerberos integration for Aeroflight, 
uh, more language bindings, and then ultimately the support for upgrading the connection. So we're doing TCP IP here, but if you happen to have a, a better uh, uh, substrate, um, then Aeroflight should be able to upgrade to that. So I can do my negotiation in TCP IP, but then, hey, you know what, I'm gonna use this RDBMA channel or something else, right, to help things out. And so when you think about it, this is kind of how we think about data access, right? You got your sources of data. You could go straight at the sources, and there's tools to do that. But if you do that, you're probably gonna put the, 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 the logic of doing that and the logic of cleansing in a place that's not easily shareable. So build that inside of Dremio. And then Dremio exposes now Aeroflight. We'll GA it in, in, as soon as it's GA'd in the community. Um, it will expose an Aeroflight endpoint so that you can get that data frame back in, a, in next to nothing time. So that, I think, is the set of things I have. Love you to try out our product. It's free to download and try out. Um, and also join the Aero community and uh, you know, chat with us, ask questions, whatever. We're happy to talk to people. That's what I got. Thanks, guys.